Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 391 of How Do You Write? I am Rachel Heron, and I'm so thrilled to be here with you today as I am talking to Ching Sun Stubis. This is a fantastic interview. We talk about um, crafting, particularly quilting as a metaphor for nonfiction, which I found really beautiful. We talk about the tremendous kindness of writers and a very, very special book. You will want to stick around for this one. So what has been going on around here? A lot. It feels like a lot. I am blowing through my fantastic copy edits from my copy editor for my New Zealand memoir called Unstuck. I'm still working on the subtitle. And oh, it just felt so good. I love being at the level of copy edits because you can move quickly. You've looked at these words so many times and you're accepting the changes. And also my copy editor is a fantastic uh, dev editor too. So it kind of used her for a little bit of both of that. I think I may have mentioned that. So I have been doing that in my working time and really enjoying it. Also in this last week, I had the supreme privilege of teaching, presenting at the Surrey International Writers Conference up near Vancouver. Of course, I was there virtually. And oh my, I was I was a bit stressed out. I um I was teaching a three-hour class on publishing. It's the same information as I um present in my online always available class called How to Publish in Today's Market. And in it I basically talk about every single detail that goes into both traditional publishing and indie publishing. And you can, yes, you can get that class for half off right now uh, at rachelheron.com slash publish. I don't know how much longer it's going to be there for half off. So go grab that if you're interested in it. Um, and <laughs> that is a four hour class over there that you can get, but I was pushing everything into three hours. So I was talking so quickly and it was a lot of brain power. Um, but it was really, really fun. And also I got to teach my one hour revision course, which I love doing. And here's the thing. I also got to teach something for an hour and a half called how to stop styling and get your writing done. Now that is an online evergreen course that I've had forever. I had dark hair. This was before I had gone white, right? That is up there. And I but I didn't have a slide deck on it. And I hadn't revisited that information in a really long time. And when I revisited it, there was good stuff in there. There were tips and tricks on how to get your writing done. But in the last few years, I've really thought very deeply going further into this idea. And this is what my master classes turn into the 90 day sit down and the 90 day revision. Um, we have so much conversation about emotional management and the true deep emotional reasons that keep us from getting to the page day after day after day. The emotional reasons that make it difficult. And so I decided to transform that class into a one hour session of, of what really keeps us from the page and how we can get there in an easier, softer, kinder, gentler way. This is a book that I have been thinking about writing and I have been playing with it for the last month as I have been seeing NaNoWriMo come up it's getting closer and closer and closer as I record this. It's the 26th of October and NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month is almost here. I do love to be a rebel. I like to do different things during NaNo. I'm on the writer's board. I absolutely love it. It is how I finished my first book that was published. I finally embraced the energy of NaNoWriMo. If you have never tried it, if you are hearing this on November 2nd, November 3rd, there is still time for you to join join us. Be a rebel. I'm going to be a rebel this year and do nonfiction. And I am declaring it here that this gentle book on how to be kind to yourself as a writer and get yourself to the page, this is what I'm going to write in November. And making it into this class solidified that for me, that it is important. This is why I talk so much about kindness to the writers on this show, because I believe that as writers, we are a certain type of person. We are type A. We are perfectionist. We get stuck so easily because we worry about whether or not we're doing it right. And here's the truth. We're never doing it right. 
and we're never really doing it wrong as long as we're doing it. As I always say, the quote that is attributed to Ellen Langer, but nobody can find out um, exactly when or where she said it, don't make the right decision, make the decision right. That is what we do every time we sit down or stand up to do our writing. We are making a ton of decisions and then we are making those decisions work for the piece of writing that we are supporting. And I want to write this book. And it freaks me out to say this about NaNoWriMo. I don't need another book. I don't need another book. I don't need to be writing 1,667 words a day, but I want to. So I'm pledging to try. I'm pledging to make this a goal. Y'all know how I feel about goals. They are meant to be moved and broken and then remade. And by doing that, we keep moving forward. So watch this space, see what happens. I'm excited about writing this book. And and here's the thing is I don't have all the answers and that is why I want to write it. That's why I wanted to teach it. Um, I feel like I'm always getting closer and closer to figuring out how to be a gentle, kind writer to myself, but I need this book more than anyone else or more than anyone else who lives in my body. So um, I think I might write it. Okay, there, that is that is established. Okay, let's jump into the interview here. Here is a little bio. For the past 15 years, Ching Sun Stubis has been a newspaper columnist and writes poems, essays, short stories, and original Chinese tall tales inspired by traditional Asian themes. Her writing is inflected with both Eastern and Western flavors in ways that transcend geography to touch hearts and reveal universal truths. Her memoir, Once Our Lives, is her most recent release. Please enjoy this interview and please dream a few big dreams and maybe sign up for Nano with me. I will probably be findable over there as a friend, although I always forget to do anything over there, um, at either Yarnagogo or Rachel Heron, all one word. I I, ch I have changed it back and forth a few times while I've been over there in the last 15 years. Oh my gosh, 17 years. So, uh, but find me, friend me, if you're going to do that. All right, my friends, we will talk soon. And here we go. Well, I am so, uh, so happy to welcome you to the show today. Will you please share your name and your pronouns with us? My name is Ching Sun Stubis. I guess it's a she, her, that's how you say it, right? Thank you. Yes, that's perfect. And I would like to wish you, Ching, a very happy birthday today. Thank you. You have caught me on my milestone. And um, so it's extra special. Oh, it's extra special for me to be able to talk to you today. I am a big believer in birthdays being special. Some people don't feel that way and I don't make them celebrate if they don't feel that way, but I think they are. And I just had a birthday um, two weeks ago. So we are not far apart on the calendar. So, so you're, you're cancer too. I am. I love my home. <laughs> I love my shell. I love all of that. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> Do you feel and like we a can cancerian? be happy? Yes. Well, I, I, you know, I was brought up, uh, born brought up in China, so we didn't have cancer. I was born in a mouse year, and mm. I supposed to be coming from a white mouse kingdom because Chinese baby supposed to be born a kind of pink skin. And I was born so white and really freaked my mother out. <laughs> and the doctor who delivered me and said that, well, the baby must be from the white mouse kingdom. So I always that's, remember that. Now I'm a that's white mouse. Beautiful. <laughs> that's beautiful. I'm, I know that I am the year of the rat. So perhaps we are, we are, so we are we, we, relatives. We, uh, we come, yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> Maybe some sometime in the past we were. <laughs> That's beautiful. All right, let's talk about writing and your process for writing, because you know that we love to talk about process on the show, and you get a lot done. Your um, memoir just came out recently. Congratulations! But you also do a lot of other writing. When and where and how do you get it all done? Well, you know, what I found, I'm kind of a self-taught writer in the sense that I only took classes. I was an English major, but I never have actually taken like a professional writing course. Mm -hmm. My writing was triggered by um, grief. 
And that's mm. how I actually I started to write. I was, a, you know, I loved, I loved reading. And ever since I was little, I was always, my mother always taught us to find everything in reading. And we could get out of poverty through reading. We could find our lives in reading. We find wisdom in reading. But um, I never really thought I was ever going to become a writer because I kind of adore writers too much. They were like my idols. Yeah. I never thought that I could become one of them. And um, so the writing process is anything but a typical. But I guess, you know, like every road leads to Rome. So we all find our own passages. One thing why I love your shows too so much, because I felt that, you know, that all different writers come onto the show and all give a very different perspective about what the writing process is like. So, you know, that uh, being a listener, someone got to find one way they would feel that it would resonate to what they want to do. Yes. And for mine, it's like I'm a much older writer than the typical writer because I didn't start to write until I was in my 40s. And I never took any lessons. It's the life that kind of fascinated me. And, uh, you know, about the writing my memoir, my parents died and I was in deep grief. And then suddenly it just, uh, all the past came back to me. And I thought about them and thought about my Lord, you know, being very ordinary people. Like we, I was born in a shanty town. My family was supposed to be very ordinary and the stories that I heard from my mother and the, my life that I shared with them and just uh, so much of it ended the Chinese history. At that time, when in my 40s, I realized how valuable um, history was. And we lived through the biggest headlines of the Chinese history, including Great Famine, including the Cultural Revolution. My mother went through the Chinese Civil War, anti-Japanese war, and all these things. So I really felt suddenly that I should become the chronicler of the, the past, of the history. And I did not want to have the piece of history to be lost. So it kind of a com kind of um, forced me in a sense that I should do the writing. I should write down the story. So I started my writing was more like writings out the past, the little pieces of the stories either I heard or lived through. And um, so the writing for anyone who never had a life writing experience before, I felt that, you know, if there's something so compelling, something that you feel so special, especially to be a writer, most people do the reading. So you kind of read a lot and you kind of know what is considered to be so special that you should try to do something for it and not let it lost. So I think that's one way that, that I started to write. And it was not a typical writing um, path, passage, but it was a, a kind of being um, brave and try to go back to the stories you didn't even want to remember. Mm -hmm. Some things were so painful that you didn't want to think about. No matter what, you wanted to continue. You wanted those things to be done on a piece of paper. But what I learned is you can never really write everything down and think it's done. Yeah. Writing down the story is only the first step about, it's like a finding um, important things. And then you try to figure out what will be the pieces that should be put together and what are the pieces that may not be included to consider like they are stories. It's like a handful of sand. They don't really stick together to become a book. So being a writer, you have to figure out how to build an arc, how to put those stories, what stories would belong into a kind of structure that you're going to build, what kind of message you really want to give to the readers. I think that those other things uh, come later. It's not going to be the first yeah. step. So I, I found that uh, you know, there are so many ways to make a successful book. And you may find your own unique way by listening to all different writers, how they write in different ways. And then 
you may find that the one thing out of, that they do actually will work for you mm, and then yeah. gradually figuring out. But main important thing is always keep it up. You know, you know like uh, don't let you, like today I'm not going to do raining writing. Think about the things. Think about things you want to write. The more you write, the better you're going to be. That's what I, I believe guess the, so strongly is that is the best way for us to get better as writers is to do the is to do the writing. What is your biggest challenge when it comes to doing the writing? That's a very good question because I felt that being a foreigner, that um, I spent the first twenty nine years of my life in China. And so, so many years I spent in America, I always felt that my world tips toward the East because I spent so many more years in China than in America. The thinking process is very different um, for those two languages. So like the logic and the rationale and mm. how we want to express things. So sometimes you write things and just like, it doesn't make sense. So there are a lot of challenges, but the first challenge, the foremost, you would really, really laugh that I could not write and type at the same time when I started out. So Tell that me was more a challenge. About that. What, yeah, what would you do? What you would you do? That, Did you do longhand then or? Yes. Oh my goodness. I realized that I realized that, that I couldn't type and think. And also at the time, the kids were very little. And it was very difficult for you to sit down and just like in front of the computer without some kids going to say, Mom, you know, <laughs> this is happening. So I just felt that I decided to do the old-fashioned way. Because I always remember, you know, I read so many, many um, writers from like 18th century, whatever, early 19th century, all the manuscripts were bound together with like a huge pile of paper. So I used the spiral notebooks, which were too big for my purse. So I cut them into half <laughs> and with a I pen. <laughs> and what I did was when the kids went for clarinet lessons, ballet lessons, um, when, I, when I, you know, when I'm out there at a playground, even the kids are playing, I would just fetch my you know, book and my little pen out and it's totally in my own world thinking about what I wanted to write down. And so most of the book of my book that I actually had in notebooks and they were very, very messy because you constantly have to kind of, well, someone's like, gee, I shouldn't be writing this. And no, I have to enter that. <laughs> but I had most of them written down in pile of notebooks. And I would say toward the end of writing, I actually started to manage to write, actually, typing to the computer. I'm like, Phew. you feel like the kid's doing a potty training. Finally, you don't have to wear diapers anymore. <laughs> that kind of feeling yeah. was wonderful. And so the writing challenge, I started, you know, from step one is literally like a kid learning how to write because I never really wrote beyond writing letters. And most of the letters I wrote, of course, were to my parents on the opposite side of the earth. So they were written in Chinese. Yeah. So I can I could recite Shakespeare's sonnets. I can recite um Longfellow, Wordsworth, you know, I loved Attica Allan Poe, but I only could recite, but I never really wrote anything so or started writing with a 20 year long writing journey of my um, book of love and so the three main ingredients for my book was the three sentences I wrote in the beginning of the book it's with tears with love and a fond memory mm. so but you know, it was it was really a big challenge. It was a daunting task. Um, also, a huge, huge challenge is that when you write a memoir, you constantly, you know, have to go back to your memory to retrieve the past. And then not all the people that you want to write, write about were your favorite, like, uncles and aunts and everybody <laughs> you adore. There are a lot of people you actually disliked actively. Yeah. And they wonder why you 
they hate you when you were a child. Make an example, my grandmother, um, you know, Ya Zheng, he, she was the one who actually um, led the entire book. It was the opening of the book. And she was really not nice to me when I was a little girl, never remembered any affection from her, never gave me a present, always saying horrible things about that shame me for being a girl. My grandmother loved boys, like a lot mm. of the older generation women, even after Communist Party of China told the people like, you know, men and women are equal, girls are, were allowed to go to school, which delighted my mother because she couldn't go to school because my grandfather wouldn't let her go to school because she was a girl, had to be educated, taught at home. So it was a lot of the challenge of uh, like um, my grandmother, um, she hated me and I never liked her. But yet when I went back in time in my memory, thinking about her life, the life she had long before I was born and um, how she became who she was. So I had to write from her perspective and not from my perspective because that's what history, the true history should be written mm -hmm. like. Was the world did not revolve around me. Mm -hmm. It was so every, the world revolves around everybody. That's what yeah. everybody thought. But being a writer foremost is how to balance the subjectiveness from, you know, and the objectiveness. Yeah. Because you have to balance the every character and from their point of view. So that was, to me, also a huge challenge. But what I learned your, so much. What is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? The biggest joy... Actually, the joy, so many, many joys, but the biggest joy I would say is um, when a book got published, actually the book united so many, many people. They, it, the book brought to me new friends, the old fr friends, the people that I hadn't, hadn't spoken to for, for years, mm. the people never thought would come back to me. Um, you know, even including those who are not here anymore, I feel that they are closer to me because of the book. That's gorgeous. So it's, 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 it's a huge, huge thing. And also when we went for book tours, um, the greatest joy is actually meeting these people, not just in writing. So many people told me, said, oh, you should write a prequel. You should write a sequel. We <laughs> love the book so much. And they also were a lot of um, Asian people uh, of my own age said that uh, they used to ask their mother, especially mother, I guess girls are closer to mothers, about the mother's past. And a mother would often say, I don't want to talk about it. So they felt that they learned so much about the historical period of time yeah. through my book. And they said that also they started to understand why their wives, their mothers would not want to talk about this particular period of history. But, you know, never say that, you know, people always say, oh, you know, sadness. But I believe I'm ultimately, you know, inside me, I'm very Asian. And I believe that everything in each other, like it's like in yang, you know, embedded in sadness, is the greatest joy that you can never experience without experiencing the sadness. Yeah. And also, that in the greatest happiness, sometimes you also experience those the extreme joy. You could have feel that. So I feel that we should understand, you know, stretch ourselves as far as we can for happiness and sadness, just kind of it's human experience mm. otherwise you would, could have never enjoy that's what I feel and that is one of the gifts that we have as a writer and that's a gift that you gave people with your book and I think that leads beautifully into the next question because you're talking about this this combining as a writer can you share a craft tip of any sort with our writers listening craft tip um to me it's again probably i would talk about um nonfiction and fiction they are so different 
um, as a writer, when I, I started out with nonfiction, you know, with my memoir, and during that process of 20 years, I started to experiment poems, short stories, tall tales, essays of all sorts, mm -hmm. from a few hundred words to a few thousand words. And I can tell you that um, you can't really tell. I mean, like when you write fiction, I wanted to just use my imagination, let them fly like as high as the sky. <laughs> and, and I could then try to make up whatever's in between juicy. And then I would talk with my husband and say, do you think that would work? And sometimes it's like a huge bloom of imagination. And he would pop it with a needle. <laughs> and I felt totally like it won't work with just my enthusiasm. But sometimes I feel it would really, really work. So that's, but in nonfiction, facts, facts, and the facts, I feel that, you know, people write like a historical fiction. Sometimes people take historical fiction and think they are like a historical, people emphasizing more on historical than fiction. But being a writer, I feel that the ethics tells me when you write nonfiction, stick to the facts. And it's so important, but it's very hard to put facts together into a book. Because a lot of facts, they are true, but it could be very boring. It could be non-inspiring. So to put them together, to me, the biggest metaphor is like quilting. I don't know if everybody would be doing quilting, but to me, the quilting is like a perfect experience about like writing a nonfiction, especially like biography or, or memoir. What we do is uh, essentially, you first have to have all these little swatches of fabric of a particular size, a particular pattern, and then how to put all these different swatches together. It's like different little uh, mm. episodes, little tidbits of facts together. Mm -hmm. So to make things more interesting, but yet you would put them together into a pattern, into a particular hue that would make it work. And then when you somehow assemble them all together and it becomes a beautiful quilt, that's what being um, like a nonfiction writer, being a, a, a memoir writer is have this ability, the eyes to see, to spot how those stories could be revolved around each other, would make things work. I think that's beautiful. Um, I've never heard that metaphor for it, but what I really love about that is all quilt artists will put together the pieces and the blocks. They'll put them together in different orders to suit their artistic eye and only they can. And, you know, quilt artists have their own artistic voice, just like writers, but they're moving around what already exists. I think that's it beautiful that's gorgeous. and they tell stories yeah. too. Yes. You know, if you ever seen that like American Indian quilts and certain and uh, you know, like a uh, um New England quilts, they actually mm -hmm. really tell you look at it, it's like a tapestry. Mm -hmm. It tells you so much about what it, what the quilter was doing yeah. without words. It's yeah. made with fabric, but that that's what I believe. Like. What a gorgeous, gorgeous metaphor. Thank you for that. May I ask you, what is the kindest thing that anyone's ever done for you in your writing career? I tell you, being the first time writer, it is hard. You know, anyone who wants to become a writer and thinks like, oh, it's a beautiful dream. That beautiful <laughs> dream really is not easy to be fulfilled. Like taking me 20 years, but I can tell you so many kind people along the way and what really, when my book was finally put together and it came to the point, you know, I was working with finally um, with an editor and, uh, um, you know, designing the book cover and came to be a very crucial question. Whose words would grace the back jacket? Mm. And it's like, oh, who would you want to have a quote on the back of your book? I'm like, do I know anyone being a first time writer? Mm -hmm. You know, I did not have a lot of like friends, like writers. So my husband popped me the question, who would you want to be? I'm like, the best Chinese writers? How about 
Dish Jen? How about Amy Tan? How about the, you know, um, Helen Zia? And I just finished reading her book, The Last Boat Out of Shanghai. And my husband said, why don't you write to them? You know, craft a query letter and write to them. I'm like, uh, they don't know me. Do you think they would write, you know, like for me and, and bother to read my book? Now, story comes short. My book has their quotes. Helen <laughs> Zia, who wrote, thank you, Mr. Nixon, who read my book and she raved about my book. She loved it. And she, in spite of her busy schedule as a Harvard professor, as a, a writer, as a lecturer, she's, she's like sought after everywhere. Mm. She wrote me a quote. And Helen Zia, who used to be the um, like chief editor of Ms. Magazine, and she is a great, great woman, inspirational woman. And she wrote for me. So I really felt like, oh my Lord, did people really do things for you? Even Amazing. though they are famous, don't be afraid. All the listeners out there, don't be afraid yeah. to ask. The worst you can get is no. Yeah. And I thought that I learned so uh, such a big lesson. And another person was that a, a beautiful, very successful architect designer named... Uh, um, Dahlia Hamoud. I met her when I was being interviewed by a television station locally, and I was never on the TV before, so I was kind of a little bit nervous, and, you know, whatever you call that. And she was there, and then we started to talk, and her big bright eyes and big smile. She finished her interview. She stood be she was behind waiting for me to finish mine, and then. She actually came to my book event oh. in Washington, D.C. And with a beautiful bouquet of flowers, I'm like, oh, I am, you know, so lucky. You know, I, and a lot of people who I did not know had even I met at my book event oh. because they came and they, among them was a, a reverend uh, um, Marcia Dyson. She's a, you know, civil activist in the United States, a very, very famous, beautiful, smart woman who has an immense schedule. And she actually came to my book event <laughs> and sat and talked to me for an hour. And it really moved me. So I, I feel there's so many beautiful oh, things, so many this. What a people list. did, you know. What a list of kindnesses that you have collected for this. So may I ask you, what is the kindest thing you've ever done for yourself as a writer? I think the biggest word here is kindest. Kind. I think we often forget being a writer. We are very judgmental. Mm. We judge ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. how did you do? Oh, this is horrible. I had to wipe it out. And these days we don't even have the pleasure of like, sharing the paper and hear the sound <laughs> or burn them in a fireplace, right? And we only can just delete his, whatever it's highlight and delete. Yeah. <laughs> and no sound, there's no satisfaction. But we are critical. We, you know, if we don't get published, we have our road, like kind of very low moments. We, we felt that the whole world is against us. Mm. Like nobody would ever want to read our words. And you know, but I felt that uh, when we are really in a low moment, we shouldn't be the one to judge and against ourselves. Mm. We should be kind to ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we often do it for the others, don't we? Easy. Like if some Easy. friend, yeah, coming, we lend them a shoulder, we, we would make them a cup of tea, we give some kind words, but we don't do enough kind things for ourselves so I really felt that you know um when I when I get a rejection letter and when I felt not happy and sometimes I would just say to myself you know what there's another day tomorrow it's yeah. not last day this person doesn't like it doesn't mean the other person wouldn't you get a, a you get a hundred rejections and you may get a one says 
hooray, I love it. Yeah. So I think just be kind to ourselves. I think that's the kindest thing I can do for myself. I love your answer. And that's why I continue to ask this question because it's something I forget so easily and so quickly, but just like putting your hand on your heart and saying, it's okay. It's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. Like that is such a beautiful thing to do for ourselves that we would do for anyone else. And we forget. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Will you share um, the best book that you have recently read and why did you love it? You know, there's so many books that I can talk about, but I thought it is extremely important for me to talk about this particular book because mm. the book I have um, is my friend. The book is literally to me is like a live person by now after mm. uh, over 40, 40 years. Mm -hmm. I first met that book when I was, you know, um, just by luck, China restarted a college exam, entrance college exam. So anyone who's, you know, who would do well could go to college after the Cultural Revolution. And I got into actually the second best uh, language colleges in China called the Shanghai Institute of Foreign Languages. And literally when after I arrived in school, the library was still filled with books laden with dust and spider webs oh, because wow. the librarians didn't have time enough to even clean the yes. books. And I found this book called 101 Famous Poems. Um, I was in love with the book because mm. I thought that it, it was filled with these famous poems from Whitman, from Longfellow, from Wordsworth, from Shakespeare, from Byron, from Keats, uh, from Pope. And they are also short. So, you know, I just, I was a, a language learner. And uh, so sometimes you pick a short uh, poem, you can repeatedly kind of uh, um, savor it. Um, and I started to read it before the bedtime. And then soon I realized I had a week left and I had to turn the book in and um, I started a, this foolish project. I took out a notebook. I started to copy the entire book <laughs> into that That's notebook wonderful. just so I could have it under my pillow and I could open to any page and I could read. And um, I was fascinated. I fell in love with Abraham Lincoln at the time because among those poems, there were also like Ten Commandments, Gettysburg Address, and uh, Magna Carta, and um, the wow. Declaration of Independence. So I read The Government of the People, By the People, and For the People. I fell in love with those few words, and I wanted to know everything about Abraham Lincoln. The more I knew about him, the more I adored him. And so then when I got my job as a, a tour escort for the Americans in the 80s, um, when I did not know what to do, I was not a trained a tour escort after just a couple of weeks of training. And I had to lead busloads of Americans in the 1980s. <laughs> and often I felt that I ran out of words. So I would recite sonnets to <laughs> my passengers. And many of them asked me what books I loved. And I said, 101 poems. One woman from California actually found a publisher and bought that book and mailed it all the way to China. Oh my and goodness. I had a copy of that book of my <laughs> own. So it's been sitting on my night table every single day. And it kind of reminds me who I am, my practically entire life of learning English. Mm. And that book was accompanying me. And the book accompanied me on my journey for being a writer as well. And sometimes when I am down and I'm low, I would always turn to Longfellow's sonnet um, about a um, psalm of life that he wrote. Mm. And I 
by now I can, I can memorize it. So I would close my eyes and just think about a poem. And um, somehow my world is brighter. So that that's a makes, book I read every other day. <laughs> that makes me so happy. I, um, my, my smile is just like hurting my cheeks. That is gorgeous. I, I am also, <laughs> I have been in love with the romantics for so long, Byron and Keats and Shelley and Longfellow and Wordsworth. And, um, and then to add to that, the others that surrounded it and to have the kindness, oh, speaking of kindness, is the kindness of that woman to send you the book and it's still on your nightstand. That is incredible. And she inscribed the book. So I always have her name and oh. her inspirational writing, you know, as well. So yeah, it, it's very gorgeous. special. That's gorgeous. Will you, speaking of special books, will you tell us please a little bit about Once Our Lives, which is now available everywhere? Yes, so, um, Once Our Lives is the story of four generations of Chinese women struggling during war, revolution, and also struggling against an ancient Chinese superstition that the entire family struggled for over a hundred years. It's a book about ordinary people doing extraordinary things in anything but the ordinary times. And um, it's, a, it's now available on Amazon, um, you know, like uh, I even find that a lot of uh, independent bookstores that carry the book. And it, it, a lot of people are telling me that they couldn't stop um, reading. So they essentially, they said, I stopped eating. I stopped drinking because I <laughs> want to see what happened to all the characters and, and their lives. And they are not sad stories. It's also a story about the love. It's about, the, you know, like how strong people can be during hard times. And, and I think that um, it's a book that uh, would make everyone stronger and give also show them a, a different perspective mm -hmm. of lives. Thank you so much for sharing that and for writing it. And where can we find you out there online? You can find me um, on my web. I have a website called www.chingsunstubis.com, just my entire name. Mm -hmm. And I am on Instagram, Facebook. Um, I quitted a Twitter because I yeah, felt it was rather. <laughs> I just, I, I felt time. really, really bad. Yeah, I had to. But um, I have my email address listed as well on my, um, you know, website. So anyone can get in touch with me. And um, I also um, love book clubs as well, that any book clubs, you know, would want to read a book and would like to talk to me. They can certainly email me, um, finding the email address um, on my website and email me. And I would love to be on Zoom and uh, ask, you know, ask me questions and I would answer the questions. And I think that uh, I would want this piece of history to be spread um, all over the world. That's what I like. Thank you so much. What a delight it has been to talk to you. I wish you the happiest of birthdays today. And thank you for being here with thank our you. writers. Thank you.